This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Here it is, another week talking smallmouth fishing. Why wouldn't you, right? We love big old smallmouth. And we got a Canadian as our guest today. David Chong's going to visit with us, and we're going to get inside his head, find out what it takes to consistently put big smallmouth in the boat. So I'm really looking forward to this episode. But before we do that, Let's talk about the real shot. Of course, they carry all the most wanted bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could ask for. Top brands like Mega Bass, Jackal, Evergreen Z-Man, Daiwa, Shimano, Dirty Jigs, Kitex, you name it. They got it all. You guys know the drill. Head on over to therealshot.com. Use my code smallmouthcrush15 and get 15% off your first order. So pretty cool. Head on over. Let them know smallmouth crush sent you there's david how are you <laughs> oh i'm awesome travis uh super excited uh, to be talking about smallmouth bass right right yeah. no it's uh it's a pleasure i'm glad i'm glad to have you on this podcast you certainly know how to catch big smallmouth uh living up in in canada you know for people that are not familiar david with with you could you just give us a quick intro kind of your background um in your experience as far as you know where where your love for smallmouth has has taken you uh you know up until now sure um well i've been i've been doing tournaments up here for well i probably closer to 30 years than (laughs) than not so i've been doing it for a fairly long time uh fished all the major tournaments up here anyways and you know we've we've been down to a few uh team championships and uh and uh you know federation championships down in the states as well so i've done some fishing down there but uh smallmouth has always been even before i did tournaments it was probably one of my my favorite fish to fish for uh it was kind of it's kind of funny because when i started doing tournaments it was still pretty much dominated by largemouth up here and i uh so i i had to really focus on learning largemouth better and then uh as the years gone on if if you're not fishing smallmouth on almost there's very few bodies of water up here. If you're not fishing smallmouth, you're not fishing to win anymore. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a whole new world out there as far as smallmouth bass fishing. Um, love it. And of course I lucky to be up here where I'm, I I'm like literally 20 minutes from 25 minutes from Lake Simcoe. Mm. So, and of course, you know, we have the St. Lawrence river, um, you know, Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm just lucky to be able to fish some of the best smallmouth fisheries in the world. A lot of options. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) Wow. So what would be, what do you consider like your home body of water? Do do you know what? I I would probably consider Simcoe, although the last few years, I honestly have not gotten a chance to fish very often because Mm -hmm. I've, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of the tournaments I've been doing takes me uh, out toward the St. Lawrence river, Lake St. Francis, Lake Ontario, and actually down to Erie even, um, not as many big events, uh, on, uh, you know, on Simcoe as there used to be. We used to have some, we've had a few major, major events up there. Uh, I can't remember. I honestly can't remember what year it was, but, uh, we probably had the biggest tournament in Canadian tournament history, um, on Lake Simcoe, the New York open, which was won by Mike DeForge, who's, who's another phenomenal, you know, smallmouth angler up here where, you know, First place was a hundred thousand dollars. Second place was fifty thousand dollars, and you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we'll ever see those days again up here, but uh, it, it'd be nice. But a lot of my time is is actually spent out east now. Uh, so St. Lawrence River, Lake St. Francis, Lake Ontario, mm-hmm. uh, love those bodies of water. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, I get on them whenever I can. That's for sure. Is you know. it? Wh- why do you think you prefer that? you know, fishing that style, uh, St. Lawrence river 
it versus you know some of the inland lakes and and Simcoe or maybe even Lake Erie. What what gravitates towards that zone? I, I don't know if I I would say I prefer to fish that style, but that tends to be you know where the tournaments that you know I, I'm I'm entered in or the bigger mm. tournaments happen to be. So that's what I you know what I'll t I'll tell you what I I fish some small bodies of water when I when I don't have to be at tournaments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, to catch a five pounder on a little pond, five pound smallie, that's incredible. You know, that's a, that's the same as catching a seven out in, you know, uh -huh. St. Lawrence or, or on Lake Ontario or, well, <laughs> so yeah. I, I wouldn't say I prefer it. It's okay. Just, it just, it's just what it is, you know, it's where the schedule takes you. Exactly. So you if you it. could, you know, describe your perfect scenario, um, time of year technique, if you could go out and target smallmouth and you could pick exactly the conditions and what bait and where you're at, what's the ideal? Wow. I love it. I'm loving it. I'm having fun today and we're catching them. What are you looking for? Wow. Um, you know what? Anytime I'm fishing for smallmouth is incredible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I gotta, I gotta put out a, a scenario out there up here, early season. We have a late start to our season up here. Uh, primarily because you know they're trying to protect the uh, the the fish while they're spawning, uh, and they put them to get their 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 uh, annual thing done. Um, but you know that that spawn period um, that can be the most incredible incredible fishing you can imagine. Of course, I'm always being a conservationist as well. I'm always torn between that. It's so much fun, but is it the best thing for the fishery? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if it was just for fun that'd be the most fun but mm -hmm. i don't know if it's the best time um other than that the fall fishing is incredible that's that's one of the times up here when you got a chance at a true giant uh you know a record you know um and 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 you could have number days you know uh we fish eerie a lot in the fall um you know 100 fish days are mm. you know fairly common you know and probably you know I'd say 60 to 70% of those fish are probably going to be four pounds or better. Oh, wow. So that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's hard to take. And, um, and then in the fall on Lake Simcoe, um, you know, we, we, we used to have a tournament, uh, in late October, uh, unfortunately because of COVID and stuff, uh, you know, we haven't had it for a couple of years or hopefully it will come back this year, but, uh, you know, it was nothing to take, uh, you know, 31 pounds to win that tournament, mm -hmm. you know? So, you had to average over six pounds a fish yeah in order to win it and uh you know of course my uh, and my personal best was caught in the fall in simcoe so you know, so what was your personal best uh 8.7 whoa hold on 8.7 <laughs> oh yeah it was it, it was what? it was it was it was a ridiculous fish it was you know i when i first hooked it i honestly thought i hooked the lake trout because at that time of year they kind of cross over because lake trout are are fall spawners. So a lot of times where you're fishing, you you run into lake trout constantly. And I really thought I hooked the lake trout when I first hooked it, and uh, it was. Uh, I actually, actually I should tell you the story about yeah. about catching because it's what cause it, 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 it is yeah. pretty funny. So I uh, I had a friend of mine who was actually my tournament partner this year for the Renegade Circuit, uh, Steve Navo with me, and uh, he hadn't fished Simcoe very often, and so he said well, you know, do you mind taking me out? And, you know, I'd, I'd like to try it out a little bit more. And I said, sure, let's go out. So we went out and it was, um, it would have been, I think the third week in October. Um, it, it was, it was, it was between the, yeah, it was probably the third week of October. And we went out there and we launched the boat and he came down to the boat and I go, ah, damn, I left the net in the back of the truck. Mm. I go, do you mind running back up and grabbing it? He says, sure. So he goes running back up to the truck, comes down. I happen to have two nets in the back, uh, my regular bass net, which is already a big net. And of course I had a pike net in the back there, which is really big. And he comes trotting down with the pike net. <laughs> and right. I'm looking at him, I'm going, okay, uh, I guess you think we're going to catch a really big fish today. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> and we got in the boat and we went off and we went out and fished and uh, it wasn't a great day. Um, it was probably about two o'clock in the afternoon. I think we had caught like maybe five or six fish. And uh, the biggest one was probably about five and a half. 
I know to a lot of people that's a big fish, but at that time of year, it's it's mm -hmm. just another five pounder. It's <laughs> it's sure. it sounds ridiculous, but you know. And I was um, long lining a uh, deep diving jerk bait, and I hooked this fish. I was probably about twenty seven feet down, over about forty feet, and I hooked this fish. And like I said, when I set hook into it, it never came up. So I thought, and I felt the weight on it. I thought, oh man, I got a laker. I'm fighting it. I'm fighting it. And it goes down, and, you know, and it comes, I get it closer to the boat. And all of a sudden, it, we see it down there because it's super clear there. And I'm going, oh, it's a smallie. Oh, that's a nice one. It's got to be five, six pounds. And then as I'm fighting it and coming up, well, it keeps getting bigger mm. and bigger. <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden, it decides it wants to jump or trying to jump. Sure. It comes kind of half wallow out of the water. You know, they're, yeah. when they're too fat to actually clear mm -hmm. the water. Follow the one and go, oh, my God. And then go and get the net there. And he, Steve gets the net, puts it underneath. We get in the boat. And we literally both stand over it, staring down it and going, how big is that thing? Yeah. Because I've um, – Simcoe's, Simcoe's an incredible body of water for big fish. I'll, that would have been – at that point, that would have, I think, was my 39th smallie over seven pounds out of Simcoe. So all I, 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 he goes, how big is the thing? I go, I don't know. I just know it's, it's bigger than any smallmouth I've ever caught. And I've caught, I think at that point, my biggest one would have been like 7.6 or something. Uh huh. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm going, uh, but I don't have a scale on board. Hmm. Cause, cause you know, in tournaments we beam all our fish. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, when I, when, you know, like when you and I, when we come in a tournament, like when we had the B1 and stuff, if you ask me how much I said, well, I think we have like whatever, 22 or whatever, but I don't really know. Cause we don't weigh them. Sure. All I can tell you is I have my best five fish in the boat. So I'm going, Oh my God. Okay. Um, okay. You might have to drive to uh, Cabela's and buy a scale. Cause mm -hmm. we got to weigh this thing. And then I realized, uh, a, a friend of mine, um, uh, was guiding that day and we saw him earlier on i said well he'll have a scale for his clients right for sure so we ran out we found him we got the scale and we waited and like i said 8.7 8. on on mm -hmm. the digital scale and so we got a couple of quick pictures let her recover in the live well and uh right and we let her go but but the thing was when steve was steve when we actually netted the fish and put it on when we were looking down at it and staring down at it he looked at me and uh he looked up and he says yep and that's why I brought the big net. Uh, right. <laughs> so what would be the record in for that? I don't know how you have it by uh, prop. You um, know, is it? I, I think in a tournament we did have one one year in the fall that was, I think it was an eight point six maybe. Um, unofficially, I um, I don't know if that was the biggest one. There's there's been every year. There's more and more. Mm -hmm. eight plus pounders uh that they're being caught you know uh do you, you think know, there's a nine pounder living I, there I, I think there's a 10 pounder wow i uh you know we've only had gobies in there since um 2012 i do believe so not nearly as long as eerie's had gobies so that foods that additional food source with the uh, with those invasive gobies in there the fish have just, I think, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I, I do believe there's a double-digit fish in there. Wow, yeah. And she'll be caught one day. Hopefully, I'm the one who catches her. Right, it. hopefully. <laughs> your next personal best. It's hard to beat that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it yeah. can be done. I uh, Man, what's the predominant pattern? You know, you mentioned you, you caught that fish pretty deep. Is there opportunities for uh, shallow fishing as well as deep there? Or how's that lake really laid out? Yeah, uh, they, uh, you know, during the rest of the season, you can always, almost always catch shallow fish. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things I, uh, I found out during the summer years and years ago, when it got really, really hot, some of those big fish just go sh so shallow. Mm. Like you wouldn't think, honestly, I, I've, I've been out there in the summer when I've had like 78, 80 degree surface temps. And you would think, oh, these fish have all gone deep. And, and, and you go shallow and here are these big black, big black girls all over the place, you know? So it's uh, yeah, there's, there, you know, for sure there's opportunity to catch them shallow as well in the fall, uh, you know, especially later in the fall, like, uh, into October and, and early November and stuff like that, uh, deep, deep is where they're at, you know? Okay. 
Yeah. Occasionally right. you'll get you'll get like I I know a few like our Thanksgiving is uh, is in October and we've had a th few Thanksgiving Day weekends where we just had an incredible mile spell and 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 I've seen them move up shallow and mm. at that time as well. But uh, for the most part in the fall, you're you're looking for them deep. Right. Right. What would you say your favorite technique or favorite way to fish for smallmouth would be? Whatever's catching them that day. Yeah. I, I honestly, yeah. I, I well know, versatile. Sure. You know, if, if I guess if I had to, I, um, I love throwing a jerk bait. Um, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 I can cover a lot of water. I can trigger fish with it. Um, and I've, well, my personal biggest fish came off of a jerk mm -hmm. bait, but, uh, you know, I've caught a lot of big fish on, uh, on jerk baits. And I, I think a jerk bait is a, is a, is a big fish, uh, presentation. Um, that, that being said, how can you, how can you argue with throwing a top water for smallmouth? Mm -hmm. it, it, it may not always be as productive, but, uh, but you, you can't argue how much fun it is when they're, right. when they're smashing top waters, you know, right. but if you made me choose one, I, I'd say a jerk bait. Jerk bait. Yeah. All right. Let's dig into that because, um, a lot of, a lot of people that chase smallmouth are, are learning about smallmouth. That's one of the prime you know, that's a bait you have to have in your box. Mm -hmm. Are you running a, a variety of different jerk baits or depending on the situations, do you gravitate sort towards certain brands, um, colors? Can you kind of give us a quick, sure. uh, you know, David, a cr your crash course when it comes to jerk baiting? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I, what I tell most people when we're talking about jerk baits is everything about jerk baiting is about compromise. There is no perfect jerk bait rod. There's no perfect line to use. Every there's always there, it's, you're compromising on everything. You're just trying to, you know, best one for that situation. Like for instance, uh, the way you work a jerk bait with that downward stroke, a shorter rod is obviously easier for you to work a bait. But when you hook that big fish, it's not the best rod to be fighting that fish with. You know, I uh, I actually had a a friend here and if he watches this he'll know who i'm talking about and other people probably do who supposedly designed this perfect jerk bait rod and it was five and a half feet long and it was if you were just worrying about working the bait if you weren't worried about landing fish if you just wanted to put a nice you know walk the dog action to it it worked great mm -hmm. but when you hook the big fish on a five and a half foot rod especially if you're using lighter line you're going to lose a lot of fish so you know uh, as far as a rod goes, I run a 610, um, a medium action, uh, you know, a uh, little bit more parabolic than, uh, th than a normal rod. Um, I do throw my jerk baits on a spinning rod. Um, I know a lot of people do still throw them on bait casters. Uh, for me, it's more that, uh, I've had, you know, some elbow issues in the past mm -hmm. and the, uh, the spinning rods a lot easier for, for me to, to, to work the bait. Uh, it's, it's hard on, uh, you know, it's hard for bait caster, but as far as, you know, jerk baits and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I use different ones for different situations. I use, uh, you know, um, you know, ones that, you know, regular jerk baits, which probably dive down to like a one ten size and dives down to about, you know, five, six, seven feet maybe. And then sometimes we'll, you know, we'll go to deeper diving jerk baits, uh, like the one I caught that other one, you know, uh, <laughs> like long lining it out there. But can, um, can you talk about that technique, the long lining of a jerk bait? Because you mentioned you 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 believe that that bait was down twenty seven feet, yep. or that fish was the the bait was no the bait the bait was was yeah around twenty seven right. feet. I do believe we're gonna have to talk about that. What's, yeah, how um, are you doing? That? Okay, so so up here in Canada, <laughs> uh, it's it's a presentation which we refer to as strolling, and um, we've had a lot of discussion up here how legal it is because. It's it's it. A lot of people look at it and say you're trolling, um, but we've had a number of organizations up here look at it and they said, you know, as long as you're not just holding your rod there and pulling the bait along with the boat, you know, as long as you put some action to it yourself and part some action, and we do, we you know, we 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 will jerk on it and you know, occasionally, and uh, you know, uh, we'll play with the bait a bit, and 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 that's how, that's the only way you're going to get it down that deep is you're going to have to have a lot of line out in order to do it um right well for, uh, down, for those down in the states down in the states uh i think most circuits down the states wouldn't even allow that right. i know when they talk about strolling they you know it's it's casting your bait out 
opening your bail, moving your boat away, and then start retrieving your your lure, right? But uh, but in this case, uh, yeah, it's that's that's strolling up here. Sure. Yeah. Now but there's that, a, I, I really only do that in the fall. That's the only time because they're deep, right? Yeah. No, that's really fascinating because first of all, a lot of times, especially in the fall, when you're trying to fish deep and you're and you're over a big concentration of fish that might be way down there, it's hard to get any type of reaction bait, you know, maybe a swim bait, or, you know, a horizontal presentation. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Yeah. And a lot of these, you know, for me, I, I like to go out and catch fish. I'm not fishing a tournament in the fall. And a lot of our listeners and viewers just want to go wreck on some big smallmouth. So I think that's a genius idea. Mm -hmm. If you want to go out and have some fun and get that jerk bait down there. Um, so I'm just going to how, I, cause I've never really experimented with it too much. I have a little bit, but I'm assuming, uh, you get over the structure that you want. You make a long cast you're opening your bail and you're basically taking your trolling motor and moving that quickly away from that bait, right? Yeah. So you want a, a bunch of line out there mm -hmm. and then you start working that bait. And because there's so much line and distance, that bait's getting down deeper, obviously. Right. Yep. And, and like how much line are you, do you think between your rod and the bait? Could there be, I mean, are you a hundred yards out? Yeah. Some cases. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah, hundred wow. yards is not, not uncommon yeah sure sure <laughs> very cool it, it, it is an interesting uh presentation and uh we did keep it quiet for a while up here mm -hmm. but you know it, it pretty well is uh is a known mm -hmm. known presentation now i uh, actually i i i i saw your uh your podcast with Scott Dobson. And I think he was talking about, he thought the Johnsons were doing that. It's mm -hmm. at some point up on Lake Simcoe and it's very possible because it is, it is a presentation that is, uh, is used quite often up here. That's yeah. awesome. That's uh that's something to think about for sure. Yeah. Especially when yeah. you get in, into those zones. Uh, how's the, uh, it's gotta be frustrating when you, when you take the time to, to line up a cast and don't get bit and you got to redo it again. It seems like it's pretty time consuming, <laughs> but you're typically around these fish that are pretty, there's a lot of activity, I would assume. Especially yeah, we, we we know what kind of structure they're on, and and mm -hmm. chances are we've already been marking them on the, uh, you okay. know, on on our sonars or you know, um, yeah. prior to actually uh, you know working the structure. Sure. Uh, but sure. like I said, that's only the fall. Other otherwise, you know, uh, you know, just just casting and uh, you know uh, the way the walk the dog action. You know, big smallies have a hard time resisting that, although. They can be finicky at time, and you know, you, you, you. I'm mm -hmm. sure you have had it when they can frustrate you, and they can follow and follow and follow, and they won't, mm. they won't, uh, they won't commit. Um, and uh, but you know, that's that's when you can, you know, you you have to change things up. You can't, you got to change your presentation sometimes. You know, if you can, you know, if you're working, you know, with most Japanese jerk baits, at least I find, if you're working it hard. And you stop and you got a fish following it if you snap upwards and it takes a bit of practice but you snap upwards on it actually you can cause the bait to spin around mm. and um i've you know I, I i i've had people watch me do that and they're like in total awe but i've been doing it for so long um, yeah and it turns around and it's almost when that bait turns around and faces that fish that fish gets really pissed off and it actually eats it, you know, good, a good number of the time anyways, not every time, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, you know, but there's different things you can do. You can speed up the bait, you can slow it down, you know, you can pause it. Uh, uh, there's other things I do to jerk baits that, uh, I almost, I used to always run a feathered trailer. Okay. I, I don't, I don't know if you do or not, but you know, I, I used to always run a feathered trailer. I thought that was, um, by far a key triggering mechanism. You know, especially when you pause it and you it's suspending in there and that feather trailer is kind of just pulsing like that. And sometimes that that's that's the triggering mechanism. But um, I actually had a, a, a incident uh, or a, a tournament up on Georgian Bay. And I realized that that feather was actually hurting me. Really? Um, yeah, it was it, it, it was I've never experienced that before. So I, I can't say I always use it now. There's there's a time and a place. I probably use it the majority of the time, but what was happening was these fish and I, I could see these fish coming in and they'd be following it and they weren't really, really aggressive, but they were very fixated on the feather. Hmm. And 
almost every fish I hooked, especially the big ones, like the four or five pounders, just grabbed the back hook because they were so fixated on the feather. Hmm. And um, I ended up, I think I lost like four that were probably in that four and a half to five pound range. Uh, we we would have probably won the tournament hands down if we landed those fish. But, uh, um, you know, I, I took the feather off. I went back out there uh, the next day and they were in the same kind of mood and I had the same thing. And I actually took the feather off. And when I took the feather off, I, I, I was every, almost every fish was eating them the whole bait and cause they were, they weren't fixated on that feather in the back. So, hmm. you know, it's, these are things you just learn from being out in the water and it's not, it's not something that happens all the time. Right. But, but you might be aware that things are, mm -hmm. don't, don't work the same way all the, every, every day out there. So every day it's, it could be different. It could, it, it could be a different cadence that, that triggers them. Right. Right. When it comes to color choices, there's so many different colors on the market. You have your, your range of, you know, almost see-through or translucent yeah. baits to bone colors to some crazy colors, right? Hot yeah. pink and, and yellow chartreuse. Mm -hmm. where, where do you find yourself gravitating towards to start? Is it- I got, I got basically two colors that I, I would start with almost every time in any body of water. And that's a, that's like a chartreuse shad type of uh, thing or a uh, what a lot of companies call a pro blue bone where it's got kind of like a a, a, a bone pattern on it and it's got a blue. Th those are almost my go-tos I'll start with. I, I carry, I probably carry 20 colors. Right. Because <laughs> if you're a smallmouth fisherman, it's just like, you know, uh, you know, we can say, Oh, I, I prefer this color too, but you probably do have 20 other color tubes with you as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I do carry other ones, but those, those are the two I almost always start with and, uh, and kind of go from there. Any crazy colors? Have you seen a difference sometimes when you, when you go with like a clown versus a natural? I, I know I've experienced that a handful of times. It's not something, and it might be just body of water too. You know, oftentimes you'll go to a body of water and you'll hear buzzwords if you're doing some research where, you know, this the clown keeps coming up. Well, you might want to throw clown if on that particular place. Um, have you experienced anything like that? Mm, um, yeah. Well, I, I get them on clown. Clowns actually, you know, probably, probably in that it's not in the A group, but it's probably in that B group, uh, mm -hmm. just below mm -hmm. it. Um, I, um, Hot pink. I, I did, I was just going to say I had one time when I, I, they were on a pink jerk bait and I honestly have never had them on it again, sure. as, like uh -huh. I did that time. But that one time, and I, they just wouldn't bite in. I go, what the hell? Well, we were just out fun fishing anyways. And mm -hmm. I threw on the pink, and and they were just, I, I don't know what about it. Mm. You know, there's nothing out in nature there that looks that color. Right, right. And exactly. I don't know if it made them mad or what, but they were eating like crazy. And and I've tried mm -hmm. it a few other times since then when they weren't biting really well. And I've, I've actually never been able to duplicate that day again. Work. Right. So right. I don't carry a lot of pink ones with me. Sure. Sure. <laughs> are, are you throwing, are you throwing jerk baits year round? Uh, yep. Yep. You are. Yep. 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 All always year long. Them. Always yep. have them always there. That's always, you know, that's always a rod that's rigged up when we, uh, when we're fishing anywhere with their small mold. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Some bodies of water, uh, like some of the inland bodies of water where, you know, the forage is more like a perch base rather than, you know, rather than a herring or, you know, or shad, you know, shad based, uh, forage, uh, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, uh, the perch finishes are, uh, are, are always, always great choices in those bodies of water. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dave, I, this was fascinating on the jerk bay. I'm sure uh, a lot of our listeners just picked up a bunch of good stuff to take to the water. Uh, I know I certainly did. I, I, I want to talk, um, you know, time's flying here, uh, when you talk, when you're talking fishing. So I want to, I want to make sure we cover a few other things, sure. uh, when it comes to smallmouth fishing, but I know you're really big into electronics and, and locating fish, uh, with electronics. I, I want you to kind of walk us through if you were just preparing for, uh, an event, a tournament, or just going out to a new body of water, um, and we're talking, you know, a deeper pattern where, where it might be summer and you know, they're off offshore where do you typically like to start or look and and how much do you rely on your electronics when you are looking for those fish well when it comes to smallmouth 
bass fishing uh, electronics is these days is almost everything uh really uh, yeah you know uh, i i know if you're largemouth fishing you can probably get away without uh you know without electronics um and, and occasionally some bodies of water where the small leaves are shallow but even then <laughs> the things you can do with the like the forward facing uh you know mm -hmm. sonar the the live scope from garmin it's it, it's incredible um what i what i usually look for if i'm going to a new body of water uh First of all, you know, we, we start by looking at Google Earth and, and Navionics charts well before we ever get to that body of water. And, and, and I love going to new bodies of water. That's one of, the, that's one of the things we love about going down to like the team championship, which we've done every year, is every year we go to a different body of water and it's, it's always cool to try to figure things out, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, look for, uh, you know, what we look for is, uh, you know, spawning areas, you know, flats where we fish with spawn and and then where would they go after that? And of course, depending on the time of year where, you know, where they're heading from there. And then once we've done that, we'll, you know, we'll drop some waypoints that we're going to go check out, uh, you know, whether it's uh, whether they're mid lake shows or, uh, you know, or particularly steep drops or or just nice sand flats, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll mark all those down so we can check those all out when we get in the body of water. And um, I, I think uh, there, there's been so many technological changes over the... I, I remember when, like, side imaging first came out. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my God. You know, instead of going over a point with uh, your traditional 2D sonar and and, you know, doing this weaving, weaving really tight, now you do, like, instead of doing maybe a dozen kind of crosses over it you might do three and with a with a side image and you can you can you can see all the structure and uh, the boulders and mm -hmm. you know you see a boulder in your side imaging and you scroll over to it and you whoop, and there's a waypoint on it it's like you know I, I thought i thought that was just incredible and then of course the detail you get in the down imaging now or 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 clear view depending what company you're with and everything mm -hmm. um yeah it's 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 like a, a picture it's no longer just uh sonar view if it it looks like a, if it looks like a tree it is a tree it's, mm -hmm. it looks actually like a tree right and then when when garmin introduced the original panoptics i thought oh this is unbelievable and then i think like it was only two years and they came out with live scope mm -hmm. and i don't know where it's going to go with electronics honestly i guess going it's it's getting to the point now you know, when you look at our boats and um, I, I know I'm sure there's people out there who don't like hearing this, but, you know, when you've just in your electronics alone, you've got like twenty thousand dollars in electronics mm -hmm. on your boat yeah. to go fishing. It, uh, it is crazy. Some, sometimes we do. Sit, I, I sit there and go, this is crazy. But mm -hmm. but if, uh, if you know, if you want if you want to, you know, make your time in the water the most productive as possible. You know, you need those electronics, you know, you need to see, you know, the, that that live scope, it changes everything. It's like it, it's like it gives you a camera in front of your boat. You can see how the fish reacts to your bait. That's the thing with 2D sonar. You, even if you're fishing over them, if we are drop shotting or thing, you can see there's a fish there. You know, you can maybe see your bait and, and all of a sudden the fish is gone or whatever or it eats it or whatever. You don't mm -hmm. know. But if you're watching it on uh, either Panoptics or, or Panoptics Live Scope, you you can actually see the reaction of the fish to what you're doing with your bait. It's um, it's yeah. it, it's such it's such an eye opener. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And and there's uh, there's time. Well, you know, being being you know up in Canada, you you know three or four months of the year, we have to go ice fishing. Right. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I can, I can, I can relate from this past winter, um, you know, being out there for some, actually fishing some walleye. Sure. And uh, we had these fish coming in and if you had a traditional sonar, you saw them come in, you're trying to catch them and, and, and they would come, they look, and then they just swim away. Right. And then we had the panoptics out and, I had a lipless crankbait. We were fishing like 30 feet down over 52 and this fish would come in and all of a sudden you see the fish there. And of course, you know, you're trying to lift it or you're trying to trigger a bite. You're shaking it a little bit, get the rattles going. And every time we did this, we actually watched the fish turn around and leave. And then we would stop, hold the rod and not move it at all. And you actually watch the fish turn back around 
because it's got it's got like a 135 degree cone angle right as opposed to your 2d sonar which might have an eight or a 10 degree cone angle so you can see so much more mm -hmm. and it would come and then you you start you oh it's coming back and you start shaking and you lift and they would turn and swim away huh right and and they said so after the second time it did that next time we held it and it came back we watched it come back around and when it came back around just held it there didn't move it and we watched the fish actually circle the bait and then all of a sudden it just sitting there and then it smashed it hmm. and then after that we were able to duplicate that up with almost every fish that came in so and you on, would on, have been able to to on, do on, that with without no nope. live scope yeah with traditional td sonar we would not have mm -hmm. been able to understand what the fish was doing and that's that's the key if you know how the fish is reacting to your lure obviously you can figure out what's going to trigger them right wow so yeah it's 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 uh, i i it, it's going to be real interesting in the next few years where this all goes you know with 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 right. technology and uh and electronics you know the funny thing is all the people up here look at the cost of like the like the life scope and you know uh that the, the other you know, like Lawrence is coming out with their version or i think they just released it and uh, everybody's going oh that's crazy money you bass fishermen are nuts hmm. do you know who's even crazier for that stuff hmm. the crappy fishermen oh right sure holy crap down yeah. there yeah yeah <laughs> down in the states every crappy guy has live scope they do and they don't think twice about spending the money on it because they right. know what it, it does for them yeah and yeah. uh you know it, it, that's why i laugh at some people up here because they think it, oh you bass people are nuts mm -hmm. i'm going yeah but we're fishing in tournaments for some pretty big money you know and mm -hmm. thing i'm going what if you were just out fun fishing for crappy for dinner and you were spending that kind of money <laughs> yeah well <laughs> and that's how i look at when when you know when i get to go out fishing i want to and, and i'll you know i've had conversations with buddies and stuff about this kind of what you're saying it's so expensive for all this electronics and whatnot but i want to go out there and set the hook man i don't want to mm -hmm. waste my time and so yep. it allows you to what we love to do catch fish yes being out in nature in the water that's all great and good but when you go out there every day man i want to set the hook on these fish yep. and those electronics are, are going to be able to to help you and just because sure. you have them on your boat you still got a, there's still a, a lot wow. more to the puzzle. This just helps you really yeah. fine tune things. Make sure you, you're yeah. on the right track. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, just cause you have $20,000 electronics, you can't go anywhere on the lake and the fish just show up. You got to go yeah. search for them. Yeah. And now you have that opportunity to, to do that because there's so much going on. You know, the yeah. problem is I'm, I'm, I'm learning new stuff on with the live scope every mm -hmm. time I'm out in the water. Yeah. You know, there's, there's something I figure out or, you know, play with different settings and you might see more, you know, and, and or discover, you know, new applications for it. Right. It's not always as right. simple as this is all it's good for. It's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of options. The other thing is the other big thing with technology wise is what did you run for a trolling motor last year, Travis? Yeah. So I had the, the Garmin force last okay. year, a brushless uh, before mm -hmm. that it was always an all treks. Um, I've had motor guides, I've ran them all, um, but that that brushless motor mm -hmm. that is like just incredible. N never mind the power in it, how quiet it is, uh, how much running time you get um, with smallmouth. And, and this is something I, I do want to talk about because we're talking about technology here. Is this past summer, whenever I've been, you know, either on my boat with the force or. You know, I, I actually have some friends who are running a, uh, a ghost as well from Lawrence, another brushless motor. And in the past, a lot of times if you're fishing shallow, you see a smallie, chances are you spook them with the trolling motor and everything. They're, they're already on guard. They're not as eager to bite and everything. We've been able with, with brushless motors actually follow smallies and it's almost like they don't even know we're there. I don't know if you, if you've, if you had seen that, you know, they, they weren't spooked at all. They were just, you know, and right. Yeah. I, I, I've noticed, um, a huge difference. It would be hard for me to go back to the old technology when it comes to a, a trolling motor, nothing wrong with the all tricks, but, uh, it was a workhorse and it, it, it mm -hmm. did what it was supposed to, but not only is it quieter, but 
you also don't get as much interference uh, in the past. I would have so, and it wasn't consistent. You know, some days the graph would be perfect. And the next day, you know, when you hit that button on the trolling motor, that you're not going to be able to see any fish down there until you take the, take your foot off the button. Oh, and yeah. now we don't have that anymore. Yeah. Uh, and my, uh, my, uh, one of my, one of my partners when we're in his boat, uh, every time we step on the trolling motor, it's, on, uh, we can, we, we basically are blind. Sure. Well, he yeah. says he can read through the interference, but <laughs> I, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not convinced of that. You know. <laughs> well, I, I think as we move forward, there's going to be so many different opportunities. And, and here's another thing too. There's a lot of good videos out there on setting up your graphs and, and there's one common thing I see and that everyone has a different opinion when it comes to the right settings, um, mm -hmm. whether it be the color palette. I find that really interesting. You know, I'm the type of guy that wants the, the best answer, the best solution to everything. And in my research has shown that I think it really is, is what your interpretation is with, with that graph and, and being able to become intimate with it, if you will. Cause once you start using it, you start seeing different things and your bait differently. And of course the fish, and there's so many different palettes and settings that you can experiment with that might be right for you where the next guy has a little bit. I I love the yellow setting um, on my Garmin and I'll have I, guys I that come I, in the boat and they just, they, they can't deal with it at all. Yeah. I think everybody's eyes are a little different too, Travis. So mm -hmm. I think you got to find what works for you. You know, that's why they offer so many different palettes, right? Um, it's uh, It's not as simple as, Oh, this is amber is the only one to use, or yellow is the only one to use. You know, it it's what works for your eyes, and uh, it's uh, but it's changing. Uh, I I I I can't I can't. It's hard to describe. There's so many situations. Well, I, I can give you um, uh, a clear one, which really bl will blow your mind. Yeah. As far as how important uh, something like live scope is, so we. Um, Obviously, uh, when I fish the Renegade Circuit, which is the Eastern Ontario Circuit, uh, we usually almost always have one event on Lake St. Francis and one event on uh, on the St. Lawrence River. So this year, I do believe the winning weight on Lake St. Francis, because it's it, it's not in the fall or, or early season, so it, I do believe it was like uh, um, around 23 pounds. Mm-hmm. Let's put, let's put it that way. And uh, which is, which for in the middle of the summer is, is a pretty good weight, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we have a smaller body of water, which is on the Rito system called Newborough. And in the past, uh, my partner and I've won this uh, with uh, just, uh, I think uh, 18 and change. And uh, almost, most of the time, if you're in that 18 pound range, you got a, you, you got a chance at winning this tournament here. Well, one team happened to get on the mother load using live scope. And they uh, were fishing, I do believe, uh, you know, uh, if I recall correctly, over 60 something feet. And they were spotting these fish that were literally just under the surface and catching them on top water and jerk baits and stuff like that uh, with their live scope. And they weighed over 24 pounds. Wow. Um, I could have made a lot of money if in the spring I put out a bet there that the winning weight on Newboro would be bigger than the winning weight on Lake St. Francis. Everybody would have taken that bet from me and they would have lost. Yeah. It, uh, it, it, we've never seen weights like that. And that, that I do believe there, another circuit had a classic there. And uh, uh, I do believe the team that ended up winning it and they, they weighed, I think they weighed 23 one day, 24 the next day and this is this is a small bo inland body of water this is not a, you know not not connected to the great lakes it's yeah. not part of the <laughs> so, so, the in, Lawrence and, so yeah. in the past these fish were well the easiest way to fish for them was to look for structure and fish on the bottom and, and maybe people didn't even understand you know just idling with their they, two they, days they never you, saw these fish right you couldn't you wouldn't have even known those fish were there yeah you know when they're suspended you know it's so hard and without that live scope uh you, you would never know they're there you would never know you know how to catch them uh etc right. it, it's just it, it, it's mind-boggling the differences um great stuff david um <laughs> we we are running out of time i got to ask you one final question we'd like to ask everybody that comes on 
and uh, I'm going to need a straight answer from you. Okay, when, if I could give you, I give you one bait to use next season for the whole year to catch smallmouth. You only get one bait. What are you going to tie on? Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but that's that's the, uh, that's the question. Oh boy, we um, need an answer. You know what? I I I'd have to go with a jerk bait. You know, really? It's, um, I uh, that says I, something. I, it, yeah. I love I I do love throwing my jerk bait, but you know, it's it it just I I, I know we're just it's 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 a theoretical question right, there, right. but but there's in reality, smallmouth fishing. Uh, every body of water is going to be different, and what sure. you're what you're going to be throwing for them is 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 going to be different. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if 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 but I had if to if choose I made one, you, it would be a jerk bait. We got to take it one step further. I need to know the brand. Can you give us that? Well, okay, I use a bunch of different brands. Right, the one I played with last year and had a lot of success. Well, I still use the other ones. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was with uh, Lucky Craft for many years, and big Lucky Craft fan still. Sure. Um, and uh and and i i i think mega bass makes uh, great baits um but the one that uh, you know what if i had to only pick one i i probably still pick a lucky craft okay you know, uh point of 100 is all well it's, rounded it's honest it's bait. honestly been my it was the first jerk bait i ever uh first japanese jerk bait i ever got i i was out traveling California many years ago and somebody convinced me to buy one I think at like $30 US at that time and, right. and and literally that was that was like 25 years ago and that was right. a lot of money for mm -hmm. a jerk bait and uh, and I I know that bait so intimately I know exactly what I can do with it I know exactly how to make it you know spin around exactly that day but Last year, um, Uzuri did introduce a uh, a 110 jerk bait in their 3DB lineup, and I'm just hoping they expand their colors. They got some great colors, but I think they need a few more. Okay. But the bait itself, for what's retail out there down in well down in the states, is it's like a ten dollar jerk bait. Okay. And honestly, it's incredible for a ten dollar jerk bait. Really? It's it's pretty close to most Japanese jerk baits I've used out there and um mm. you know if all right i'm writing that down what's it called <laughs> you're gonna make me spend a bunch of money now Yuzuri? <laughs> it's the Uzuri. it's it's in their 3db uh, lineup and it's just the uh, it's okay. the 110 jerk bait and they, they got a 110 deep model ah nice yeah yeah so they got two models and just the right size you know 110 size is is perfect you know there's mm -hmm. lots of big uh you know, Vision 110 fans out there for Mega Bass, and and again, yeah. a great dirt bait. But you know, yeah, I, you can buy you can sure. buy three of the, three of these Yuzuris for for one Mega Bass. <laughs> right, right. No, so, I agree. I agree. So, so. Good stuff. So I know I know you do a lot of stuff as far as bass fishing and media and and whatnot, David. How can people follow you and and see what you have going on throughout the uh, throughout the season? What's the best way? Sure. Uh, well, you can uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, David Chong, Fish Hard Dream Big, and on uh, you know Instagram at uh, Fish Hard, and on Twitter at Fish Hard Dave. So it's uh, I'm I'm I usually will respond to uh, private messages there pretty quickly if you if you need to contact me there. Um, if I if I don't, it's because I'm practicing for a tournament mm -hmm. or in a tournament. That's right, that's the only right. time I won't respond. Uh, you know, fairly quickly. So if you don't hear from me a couple of days, just assume I'm in a tournament. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. David, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Uh, fascinating. We could, yeah. we could talk another three hours. Unfortunately, oh, listen, you know. when it, when it comes to talking small <laughs> mall fishing, we can, yeah, sure. we can go on. We, we never even got into drop shotting or I know. a tube or net rigging or, or Carolina rigging, you know, mm -hmm. there's, you know, we, we could do a whole second show just, just on, uh, just on those presentations. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, <laughs> in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to put this offer out there. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have you come on our live, our YouTube live show at some point here and, uh, and really dig into some of those topics. Cause sure. there's so much going on. I mean, yeah, yeah. just your, your, I mean, I can tell you could, you could sit down and do a two hour seminar on jerk baits alone, you know? Oh, I mean, I've, I've done, crazy. I've done many of them. 
Yeah, I've done many yeah. of them, and and most sure. time I leave people scratching their heads, and you know. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, now yeah. I'm gonna definitely try these Yozuris. I'm gonna try to make that bait turn around, and I'm also gonna try the long lining. Uh, that's what I got out of out of this conversation. So um, I learned something new every week. I know the viewers uh, and listeners do as well. So thank you very much, yeah, David. And, for all and you should, if, any, if anybody out there, I assume if you're like me, and we're always, and I know you are, we're always striving to be better. We're always striving to be better. So if you're not open-minded and uh, willing to try different things, I'm always looking to add presentations, you know, try different baits and stuff like that. You know, you do the same old, same old all the time. You're going to have some success, but you're not going to have that consistent day in, day out success that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. especially when you're coming to small mouth who are, who are constantly changing. Well, thanks, David, for joining us. Thank you, the uh, viewers and listeners. My privilege. Yep. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. Okay. Honored. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.